Hello everyone, so today we're going to be looking at Animal Studies of Attachment. I'm following along with the AQA Psychology textbook for A-Level Year 1 and AS with the green head girl on. So the things you need to know and be able to recognise, on your specification point it says Animal Studies of Attachment, Lorenz and Harlow. So what we're going to do is look at these in detail for your AO1 marks, but you need to be careful if you get a question on these sort of research because you could be asked about the procedure of their research or you could be asked about the findings or both. So you need to be clear because if you start talking about findings when it's asking for procedure, you cannot get the marks. So we're going to break this down and really look at it so you can be clear on what bit is going to address a particular question that comes up in that type of phrasing. Firstly, we're just going to have a look at some key terms because you might not be familiar with these. We have ethologists, imprinting and maternal deprivation. Now, ethologists are individuals that study animals in their natural environment. Imprinting is an innate readiness to acquire certain behaviours during a critical or sensitive period of development. And maternal deprivation is the consequences of a separation between a child and his or her mother substitute. And Bowlby, which is a researcher we will look at, proposed that continuous care from a mother is essential for normal psychological development. Firstly, the textbook does not do this, but it is important to be able to recognise this particular bit just so that you can understand the study. Lorenzo's independent variable and dependent variable. So independent variable is what you are manipulating, it's something you change. So in Lorenzo's study, it was who the goslings saw first, whether they saw Lorenz first or the biological mother. And the dependent variable, which is the thing that's being measured, was who did the geese follow? Did they follow Lorenz, imprint on Lorenz, or did they follow the mother? And that was all observed by Lorenz himself. So we'll now have a look at Lorenz's research. So his aim was to investigate the formation of attachment in non-human animals and the concept of imprinting. So by that we mean the readiness to acquire certain behaviours. The yellow is our procedure and the blue is our findings. So if we look at the yellow, what Lorenz did was that he divided a clutch of goose eggs. Now half the eggs were hatched with their mother in their natural environment, so that's what would normally happen. So that's the control group. And then half the eggs were hatched in an incubator where the first moving object they saw was Lorenz, and that was an experimental group. So Lorenz made sure to mark all of the goslings so he could then determine whether they were from the naturally hatched batch of eggs or the incubated ones. And the behaviour was then recorded. If we look at the findings, we then see that the experimental group followed Lorenz everywhere, whereas the control group followed the mother everywhere. And when the two groups were mixed, the control group continued to follow the mother and the experimental group continued to follow Lorenz. And that could be determined because they're all marked. And Lorenz found a critical period in which imprinting needs to happen. So it varies in species, but it can be as little as two hours. And if that imprinting does not occur during that time, Lorenz found that they did not attach to a mother figure. So therefore, Lorenz concluded that attachment is innate. It's like a biological thing. You do not learn it. It's present from birth. And this is because the findings suggest that the offspring imprinted on the first moving object they saw after hatching. So the ones that were in the incubator imprinted on Lorenz because he was the first moving object and the ones that were with the mother imprinted on the mother. Your textbook further goes on to talk about sexual imprinting. So this is something else that Lorenz researched. He was interested in this. He wanted to investigate the relationship between imprinting and adult mate preferences. So birds that imprinted on humans would later show courtship behaviour towards them. So they would want to mate with them. And Lorenz also then described a peacock that had been reared in the reptile house of a zoo where the first moving objects that the peacock saw after hatching were giant toy toises. So as an adult, the peacock would only direct courtship behaviour towards giant toy toises. So this meant that peacocks had undergone sexual imprinting. So he could find this relationship between imprinting and adult mate preferences later on. We have generalizability to humans as a limitation here. So we know that Lorenz was interested in imprinting in birds, 
but some of his findings have actually influenced our understanding of human development. But the problem we have here is the generalising aspects from birds to humans, because our attachment type, which is mammalian, is quite different to that of birds' attachment. So mammalian mothers show more emotional attachment to young than birds do, and we can see that by observation. And the mammals may be able to form attachments at any time, and this becomes harder as we get older. So it's not appropriate to generalise Lorenz's findings to humans. Another limitation is that some of Lorenz's observations have been questioned. So here we can use Guyton. So what Lorenz argued was that imprinting has a permanent effect on mating behaviour. But this is not true when we look at Guyton's research. So he found that chickens imprinted on yellow washing up gloves would try to mate with them as adults. So that is exactly what Lorenz would predict. But with experience, they eventually learn to prefer mating with other chickens. So it does suggest that the imprinting on mating behaviour is not as permanent as what Lorenz believed it to be. So we now jump back over and we're going to have a look at Harlow's research. The independent and dependent variable are here again, so we'll just have a look at that for your own understanding. So the IV in this research is whether the surrogate was wire with food or cloth with no food. And the dependent variable is how long the monkeys spent with each surrogate. So how long they spent with the wire one and the cloth coloured one. And what we do find is that they spent up to 22 hours out of 24 hours with the cloth covered monkey. So Harlow realised that newborn rhesus monkeys usually survived if they were given a cloth to cuddle, but didn't if they were left alone in bear cages, so without mothers or anything else. And Harlow therefore wanted to investigate whether baby rhesus monkeys need comfort more than they need food. So he used 16 infant rhesus monkeys and he separated them from their mothers and raised them in isolation in cages. Now in each cage there were two wire mothers. So picture two wire mothers and one has a cloth on and one is just completely bare. And you've got two different conditions. So you've got one condition where milk is dispensed from the wire mother only and then in the second condition, you've got milk, which is dispensed from the cloth covered mother only. And now regardless of which one is dispensing that milk, so it's only one, the baby monkeys always go and cuddle the cloth covered mother in preference to the wire one and sought comfort from the cloth mother when frightened, regardless of which one it is that dispenses the milk. So what we can conclude is that contact comfort is more important than food when it comes to attachment behaviour. Maternally deprived monkeys as adults. So Harley followed the monkeys up who had been deprived of a real mother to see if that maternal deprivation had a permanent effect. And he found that there were severe consequences specifically for the monkeys who were reared with wire monkeys as mothers. The critical period for normal development, Harlow also concludes that there is this critical period for attachment behaviour and it's that an attachment figure, a mother figure, has to be introduced to an infant monkey within 90 days because if they're not, attachment is impossible and the damage that is done by that early deprivation becomes irreversible. We now look at some evaluation. So we have a theoretical value and this is a positive, is a strength. Animal studies into attachment formation have contributed greatly to our knowledge and understanding of how attachment forms. We've gathered a vast amount of understanding from these particular studies. And Lorenz's identification of a critical period for attachment did actually lead on to further research. So that's Bowlby's monotropic theory. And also Harlow's research contradicts learning theory, as Harlow's findings suggest that contact comfort is more important than food. So in learning theory, it argues that attachment is a result of food. You attach to food because you're being fed by a caregiver and that's how you attach. But actually, Harlow finds that contact comfort is more important than food through his research in how the attachment develops. And Harlow also showed us the importance of early relationships for later social development, including the ability to hold down adult relationships and successfully rear children. 
A further strength is that we have a practical value out of Harlow's research because it's been able to be applied to practical contexts. So it's helped social workers in the sense that it's helped them to understand risk factors in child neglect and abuse. And so now they can intervene to prevent that from happening. We've also found that these findings are important in the care of captive monkeys. So we've studied monkeys. We can't just apply things from that to humans. We can also apply it to their own species. So we can now understand the importance of attachment figures for baby monkeys in zoos and in breeding programs in the wild. So it's also been beneficial to the animals themselves. So we have a limitation now, and that's ethical issues. This has been hugely criticised in terms of Harlow's research. So if you think about the monkeys, they're quite similar to humans. So it's presumed that their suffering was quite human-like. And Harlow was well aware of the cruelty of his research because he even called the wire mothers iron maidens, and that was after a medieval torture device. But the counter argument to doing this research is that it was important enough because we've got a lot out of it in terms of what it can mean for animals and also what it can mean for humans. So it's justified the effects of conducting such research. So can Harlow's findings really be applied to humans? We have different aspects, different opinions on this in terms of whether psychologists agree on it or disagree. So we're looking at whether non-human primates can be generalised to humans. So humans are actually more psychologically complex. If you think about us, we have to do social interactions a lot more than what monkeys do. And we have to make more conscious decisions. So the argument against applying those findings from the animal studies we've looked at to attachment is that generalizability, because we don't know how similar attachment is in humans and monkeys. We're just making assumptions in this sense. But the argument for applying to humans is that we can have control over the conditions in animal studies. But then in humans, we can only study existing cases of deprivation. So in theory, in monkeys, we can create the deprivation, but in humans, we are just given a human who may have been deprived, but we cannot change that aspect. We cannot create those conditions for experiment in humans, whereas we can in animals. So here we have an AS paper one from June 2016. Now, this is quite an interesting question because it's asking you to give the name of the researchers and the type of animal they studied. Now, in terms of names of researchers, you need to know your key ones. If they're on the specification, you must know them. But in terms of the smaller studies that you're using in evaluation, do not get bogged down by thinking you have to know every person's name. You don't. If you started talking about a piece of research, the examiner will click on and understand what you're on about because they'll notice it on the mark scheme. So don't worry about having to know names because you don't in that instance. But for this particular question, we can see it says researcher A found that young animals seem to attach for comfort rather than for food. And then researcher B found that mobile newborn animals would follow the first large moving object that they saw. And as you can see, you've got a name researcher A, you've got a name researcher B, and you've got to state the animals that they studied. And we can see from that that researcher A is going to be Harlow and monkeys and researcher B is going to be Lorenz and geese. If we take a look at your mark scheme here, you can see that they were both AO1 marks on both of those questions. You can see Harlow, monkeys, Lorenz, geese. Here also what you can note is that uh, Lorenz did not just study geese, he also studied other birds, so he did study pigeons and doves. But remember it's Guyton that studied chickens, so if you put down chickens that would not get any credit because you've got the wrong person there. It does say there that you can credit birds. So we've also got an AS paper 1 June 2018 question. This says briefly outline the findings of one animal study of attachment and explain one criticism of the study. So you've got to be careful here because it has outlined the findings. So you've got to specifically be talking about findings. If you mention procedure, you are not going to be getting the marks. It says one animal study, so that's giving you a choice. You can use any animal study there and explain one criticism. You've got to be using criticism. Nice thing about this spread is that you can always mention ethics. And I think that sticks with people quite well, the ethics side. If you look at your mark scheme, you can see your possible content 
and your possible content in terms of criticism as well. So you've got the outline there. You see here also that it's an even split. It's a two and two. It is an AS paper, remember, as well. So A012, A032. You've got the criticisms that we're looking at, your possible content. You can keep it quite basic in terms of how you have outline, in terms of the findings. And also the criticism must match the study outlined. So it can't just be any old criticism. It has to match that study. So you've got to be really careful when you're answering that type of question. We also have a level paper one, June 2018, outline how Lorenz and Harlow studied attachment using animals. So how? Let's take a look at the marks. So then looking at the mark scheme, we see that it is looking at procedural details. It states that on there. So important to get familiar because if a question is saying how, it wants procedure. So make sure you remember that. Look through the possible content there and try and form your own answer. OK, thank you for listening and best of the luck with the rest of your revision.